what does it take to jump into the drifting sport? What to expect and what maybe not to expect and show the automotive community that no matter what your favorite adventure is, you can go out there and you can do it as long as you have the right mentality. Welcome back to the Talk Motorsport Show, bringing you behind the scenes and under the hood of motorsports and video games. I'm your host, Billy Sullivan, COO of Grease Monkey Games. And with me, I have Aaron Potter, the director hey. of Grease Monkey Games. And special guest joining us, Alex Martini. How's it going? <laughs> How's it going, guys? It's good to see you. It's, uh, it's interesting having the time zone change, but I'm very excited to be here. Hopefully you guys are doing well this morning. You got some coffee, it looks like. Yeah, just just me. Aaron doesn't drink coffee, so uh, it's, it's, it's a coffee thing guy. working on it. Yeah, that means two of us like to party, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll give her a shot another time. What time is it where you are, Alex? Where, I always forget where you're actually based. Uh, yeah, so it's 5.32, so I'm Central Standard Time in, in the United States, which means I could have coffee right now, but you'd probably have to add some Kahlua. Otherwise, you'd probably get judged just a little bit for having a 5.30 coffee. So <laughs> a little bit more in the evening, but nevertheless, you know, happy to be here. I love that every time I see you, you're wearing the Talk Motorsport shirt. So in my brain, you're just like living and sleeping in that t-shirt. Please confirm this is accurate. 100% cotton, first print. I'm going to sign it. It's going to be a limited run. <laughs> I'll sell it in a, in a t-shirt box like 10 years from now when you guys are like massive. But <laughs> nice. I do have the gray. I just want to be clear. I do have a gray one too. I actually wear the gray one more than the black one because I have... Like, I just like gray shirts a little bit more. But the problem is, is because I wear it when I'm not filming. That means that when I'm filming or when I'm doing stuff like this, I only have the black one. So that's why you always see me in the black one and not the gray one, because I'm always wearing the gray one typically, like, on a normal day. There you go. So you heard it here first, everybody. Um, Alex does wear the gray one more. Um, <laughs> love that. So what? <laughs> what, for people who don't know, the cat is out of the bag in terms of what you're doing with us, but can you give... Give everyone a breakdown of, of uh, you joining the team and what are you going to be doing with this? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess a little bit about me is um, my name is Alex Martinez. I've been in the automotive aftermarket scene since I could even look at cars and understand what they were. So probably, gosh, 14 years now. Um, always been just a car fanatic. Loved take essentially just taking cars and making them you know, less reliable. Um, and that's kind of been my bread and butter ever since I was a kid. So I've been surrounded by learning how to modify cars uh, through the internet, uh, through the days of, of Facebook and YouTube. And so pretty much my, uh, my whole thing has been about trying to teach other people and, and educate you know, automotive enthusiasts through, through online videos and photos and memes and just funny stuff. And I'm part of the, the Torque Motorsport team as the, the brand ambassador here in North America. So very excited to be a part of that, which means... Um, I'll be going behind the scenes at uh, places like Formula Drift events, talking to some of the pro drivers, some of the prospect drivers, um, and just essentially getting more involved in the automotive community. And then also kind of talking to people here in the States a little bit about Torque Motorsport and uh, what they're up to with the different games and development and NFTs and all that sort of good stuff. So pretty excited. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I always tell this little story, me and Aaron, we're talking about you know, the types of people we want to get on the team for the media side. And we're like, yo, who's this guy, Alex on, on YouTube? We're watching your stuff. And we're like, it'd be cool to have someone like him. <laughs> 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 and then here we are. Um, yeah. Aaron, you were, it was good. It was good timing. Like we, we obviously needed someone on the, on, on the ground in, in America because we miss so many events and it absolutely kills us. So yeah, it's great to no, have it's, you on it's, board, it's, dude. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's an absolute blast. I mean, I remember ever since I was a kid, I think I've always dreamed of actually, I should state this not just because we're talking, but my actual first like childhood dream job was working with a video game company. Um, <laughs> nice. My second one was to, to, to be a race car driver, to which my dad said, that's not actually a job it's actually <laughs> the opposite of a job that's how yeah you, spend you, you gotta spend you gotta spend a lot you know, of it's money kind of like the the age-old saying of like if you want to you know build a small fortune in racing you have to start with a, a big one because <laughs> you don't make any money but uh i'm happy to cross at least that one off the 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 old box of, of being able to work with a with an awesome video game production company like you guys so 
Happy it's, to be here. It's funny that there are two, two roles that people say aren't jobs, but here we are. There's, <laughs> you know, video games. Yeah. People always say, yeah, that's not a thing. You can't make games for a living. You just play them. You would be shocked at the amount of uh, businesses you can build on the concept of just making YouTube videos. And I would, I would argue even, you know, probably 10 years ago, you'd get laughed at for even the, the idea of making a job through the internet like this. And, and it just goes to show that if you really, I think if you set your mind to, to just about anything in today's day and age, you know, there's an opportunity out there for you. And that goes for a lot of people that are looking at the automotive industry. Maybe they're not mechanics, um, but they're passionate about cars or racing or driving. And they, they think they have to go to UTR. They have to go to a technical college to, to be around cars because they have to be a mechanic. And the answer is, is no, you don't. You, you really don't. You can enjoy these things without, you know, being the traditional version of them, I guess, which is really exciting. That's awesome. I actually wanted to, before we go into the more history of your YouTube background, I want to hear more about your cars because i know you've had many cars in your life and there's actually a new one in your life recently that yeah. even gotten got built up walk us yeah, through so the, <laughs> there i have this thing where i really just i enjoy driving anything i can possibly get my hands on um i'm i'm not partial to much i would say that my favorite brand out of all of them will probably be porsche mm. and will always be porsche but um, I've owned everything from Mitsubishi 3000 GTs to old uh, Mercedes Benz to Audi R8s um, to Corvettes. I mean, domestic cars. I've had a Datsun that was 355 swap that had a supercharged V8 that I learned how to do an engine swap in when I was you know, 19 years old. Um, I think I've owned probably 25 cars ish or so. Um, but right now, currently, we just finished up a 2001 Honda S2000 that I bought oh, from nice. a friend. I've, I've known about this car for seven years. Um, I've, I've been around this car, and I finally picked it up, uh, and we decided to do a case swap in it. We put a big turbo, uh, E85. It's right around 400 and, I think, 80 horsepower right now. We're turning it into a time attack car for next year because we're going to do a whole video series on getting our uh, SCCA certification so that we can go professionally uh, race, you know, wheel to wheel. That's the goal. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I think you're um, in, in competition with Aaron in, in terms of collecting cars. <laughs> You've yeah. got like a list. Well, I've been losing them lately. Yeah, too, so. yeah rip, rest <laughs> in peace. I would assume Aaron's cars are more reliable than mine. I'm not. I'm I'm definitely not. I'm a passionate enthusiast. (laughs) Can we talk about your discovery for a second? And uh, I I borrowed it a few times and you had to do the hokey pokey and turn around. Oh, my God. I had been to a couple of mechanics. This is our tow vehicle. And it just, just, they couldn't find the problem. It just chose when to start and when, you know, I ended up to have to, uh, in Australia, there's something called start your bastard. (laughs) <laughs> and it's basically you spray it into the intake to really you're like if there's spark the engine should start and anyway um that thing was stolen a, a couple of uh, a month ago so it's probably you know a blessing in disguise to be honest so yeah i used to have uh, i used to carry around a, a carb fluid starter for my yeah. Datsun, <laughs> and i would just keep it on me because i Me and my friends built it in our garage and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, And I blew up the motor, I think once just by sheer ignorance. And when I did finally get it running one summer, I always had to carry it with me because every once in a while just wouldn't start. And I could never really figure it out. We ended up having to do a whole new wiring harness. We went through, we did new plugs, new wires and everything. And then it ran beautifully. And right when it started to run beautifully, I decided this is a great time to sell the car. And I got right back into another unreliable car. I think I bought a, a Subaru STI that I had for like six months. Oh, months. you should have kept that, dude. <laughs> it was the it was an 08, it had the hatch. I, I took it off roading quite often. Um, very plasticky interior. It probably just rattled itself apart because I kept <laughs> driving it like a truck. But uh, not a rally car. Looks like a really nice rally car. Could be a rally car, but a stock version is not a rally car. <laughs> I feel like there's some of the best times is like working on beat up cars or not even beat up cars, just cars that are breaking down. You've got all these, these kind of small things you got to do to get them going. And like your friends think you're an idiot, you know, not buying like a Corolla or something's reliable. 
But like, that was some of the best times of me growing up, just working on this old like Mitsubishi the Lancer that we took out and modified up. And then we took it out and did a rally race with my dad. And the, um, the alternator broke and the, the lights went out. We had a light a torch out the window trying to find out where we're going. And there's all these dramas at the time, you know, it sucks. You're cold and you're annoyed, yeah. but looking back, it's like, God, that was, that was fun. <laughs> yeah. There's like, there's something about it too, because all of my cars, I kind of make, my friends make fun of me because almost, you know, all of my cars have some sort of odd behavior or issue. And they're like, you know, why don't you just go buy, you know, a new Subaru or a Civic SI or a Type R and just not have to worry about, you know, these these really odd situations you find yourself in. And I'm like, well, yeah, but you're the one that always brings up the time that you had to push a Datsun 280Z down a parking garage because the battery didn't work with the starter. And you remember that memory just as much as I do. Yeah. It wasn't fun then, but it's hilarious now. All these memories are brought to you by my collection of ragtag, terrible, not very well-built cars. Like, you should be thanking me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> when for you did that, like, segue into making content around cars is it like there's all these you know things happening with the cars and building up it's kind of interesting or i hope people find it interesting did you start documenting yeah. it well really what it came down to was i started making a lot of content back when i realized that there was a larger audience than just wisconsin uh, <laughs> in the united states that kind of felt a little bit like i used to feel um I, when I first jumped into the car scene, I felt very like alienated. I felt very uh, not welcomed, I guess, just because it's a, it's a tougher group to get into. Not everybody's, you know, the happiest to see a newcomer or somebody that looks like they're 10 years old um, trying to jump into the scene. And as I kind of earned my stripes in the local community and, and grew a, a, a car club that now has like 60,000 members here in Wisconsin, I quickly learned to realize that there's people outside that may also need help or may want to also talk about some things that are bothering them. So I started making content through YouTube um, through a channel that was called Automotive Millennial. I don't have the channel anymore, uh, but what I did is I talked about, you know, different topics, different things, different t like tricks and tips and ways that you can get into the scene or, or things to know about certain cars or ideologies. And People really enjoyed it. It was the first time that anybody had really, had really kind of sat down and talked about those things, um, which is ultimately what kind of spearheaded me into, you know, my professional career, you know, at Fitment Industries and things like that, where it was taking concepts of, you know, just educating the enthusiasts and, and people out there in just a really fun and relatable way. Because at the end of the day, like when I shot content, I was still the same dude that was breaking perfectly reliable cars. Like I was just <laughs> like them, probably worse. Um, I just enjoyed learning about things and then kind of teaching people that would be open to hearing it. Are we talking like early 2010s? No, so off? we would have been, I started shooting content for YouTube back in 2012 for Wisconsin Car Enthusiast Club. Did that for probably five years, got that up and rocking. River Valley Road Rally was another one that we started, which is a really fun road rally. That began in like 2015. We launched in 2017. But in 2015 to 16 is when I really started shooting content on my own channel, which then spearheaded into 2017. And then now in 2022, I kickstarted my own channel again called um, Alex.Martini, like the drink. Makes it easy to remember. <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. And what's, what's the kind of the goals for you going forward? I think I heard, you know, something about owning a Porsche. Is it a 911? Oh yeah. Or an old. Gosh, if it was up to me, I'd have a huge garage and a tiny house. Um, <laughs> but what I can say is the, the goal here, my goal, I guess, in, in the content world is to showcase, I guess, show different cultures and communities, um, a group of people that are interested in seeing them and, and just try to break down the barriers of of some automotive um, subcultures uh, drifting i think sometimes has a little bit of an obstacle to get into because it's you know a little scary so how do we break that down and get people behind the scenes access to see that people like mike power over you know in formula drift are everyday goofy absolutely hilarious mm. wholesome people that aren't these massive you know 
Hollywood stars. They're just everyday, you know, enthusiasts and kind of taking that in, in all different forms of automotive activity, right? So uh, high performance driving, drifting, drag racing, car shows, all of those things where, you know, there's some really cool people out there that, that have a really awesome story. Um, and I just want to share that with people that, that are willing to, to hear it. It's funny. It's funny you say that. Like it is, it is somewhat intimidating to, to try something new and to do a new mo- motorsport. But when you when you get into it, everyone is super cool and and willing to teach and and really give it a go. Like like drifting, you know, you always get this kind of impression of what type of people they are. But it, they're so cool. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, Billy and I have been out there just like breaking shit, and and you know they've always been helpful. And so. Um, yeah, that's one thing I've definitely learned is that the 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 communities out there are open and and just just want to get out there and 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 rip, rip it up, but basically, yeah. so yeah. I think there's always you know in, in any market, right? There's a little hesitation uh, of maybe accepting someone, but in the same sense, there's that hesitation towards jumping into something new. And I think just addressing that sometimes and walking into a sport, and I think drifting does this very, very well, where you can go in and you can essentially say to the person that you're, you know, you're parked right next to, I've never done this before. Like, help me or ride Mm. along with me, or could you give me some pointers? And, you know, nine times out of 10, those guys are going to say, absolutely. Like, I'd love to ride along with you or, Hey, let me help you, you know, get through the, the initial test. You know, maybe you're doing a figure eight around a couple traffic cones before you can run out onto the track, but you know, they help you. They want to be a part of your growth. They just want to make sure that you're doing it for, you know, the right reasons. And I completely respect that. There's a lot of heritage in drifting. And I think they, the, the American culture tries to, you know, pay respect to that heritage, at least in the grassroots sense, as much as they possibly can. Yeah. Like obviously drifting has gotten much, much bigger over the years, like back in when it started in Japan. Do you think we're keeping most of the you know, the feeling of what it used to be on the back streets or are we kind of losing that a little bit in the, the professional circuit? I think it's, I, I don't think it, we're losing it. I just think it's different and it's changed. Mm. Um, I can't speak as, as probably as experienced as some of the people that are, that are jumping over to Japan, you know, every other month to, to go hit a, a circuit or a drift event. But what I can say is, you know, the sport just between Japan and America are two vastly different, um, you know, ways of going about it. I would I would argue that there's a lot more flow and style that's still a, a very strong pillar of what the Japanese drifting culture is. And a lot of those tracks in Japan are more technical and are smaller, um, which means that you're not really relying on as much heavy horsepower more than you're relying on the flow and carrying the weight from one turn to the next turn and really trying to look up and, and visualize where you want the car to go, not playing any dismissal to American drifting and professional drifting, but those tracks are much bigger. And mm. those, those initiations require so much more speed and so much more horsepower. And the byproduct of that are the thousand horsepower drift cars with insane angle you see running up road Atlanta I mean, could they run a more technical track? Absolutely. But that's not really where they're running. They're running at these sweeping curves that that require a 120 mile an hour entry point. So, or initiation. And I think that's where sometimes people say, you know, which one's better? I think they're both great. Um, and I think almost everybody on both sides of that scene are doing it because the sport is incredible, not because one's better than the other. I would actually love to see um, the bigger horsepower cars or American drifters to do it on the smaller, tighter circuits. I think that would be interesting or or maybe even having horsepower limits or something. Um, Because like, you know, we we had uh, Darren Kelly in the office the other day and and we were talking about it. He he had this massive nostalgia kick going. He was talking about his, you know, his, his, R thirty four and 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 you know he he loved drifting it and stuff. It's like, yeah, I think it, it, you are absolutely right. In 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 the FD um, comp, you're just running big walls. You know what I mean? And a, a lot a lot more intimidating, but they you know and they're going in a lot a lot quicker. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, there was a there's an you- event here in Wisconsin called uh, Ash. 
Club FR runs it, but it is it's a lot of that. The track up here is very technical and it's very small, which actually means that you don't need as much power. And sometimes these semi pros will come into the track and quickly realize that they don't need as much power as they're throwing into the track. So you can kind of see them adjust their their style and their behavior as the two day event goes on, which is really, really cool. I was actually just watching a video. I mean, not even, oh gosh, last week um, with, it was DK, it was the drift game. It was like Mr. Uh, Chushia. And he was talking about his experience in a modern drift car. Um, and the modern drift car that he was driving around, I can't remember if it was like on Ibisu, but he, he took the car out. It was only like 400, 430 horsepower, which was more than what he was running with. And he didn't even touch the hydro and mm. just completely clutch kicked all the turns, just got really into the flow and control of the car. He had never been in this car before. And in the post interview, he was talking about these higher horsepower drift cars. And what he had made mention to was the hydro. And he said he never uses it because he, he never really needs to. The only time he'll ever actually use it is if he feels the car is going to go into a, a head on collision with a wall or a barrier and he wants to save, you know, the engine. He wants to make sure that the engine doesn't get damaged. I mean, just that that principle and that ideology around how that individual may drift compared to when you look at some of these setups here in the States. I mean, it's just a vastly different platform mm -hmm. and what you're doing to get that car to slide. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we um, want to get over to more FD events, hopefully this year or next year. But yeah, we were supposed to go um, to a lot of events this, this year, but um, <laughs> this year's year. has gone quick. <laughs> I don't even know what the hell's happened. But um, no, we, we I, I would say we are definitely going to go next next season. Um, I would love to do Long Beach again. Um, you got you got to go to Atlanta. I'm super super jealous. Over yeah, we were there at the same time, Alex, and we hadn't even we, we hadn't connected that yet. That we were that we were there at the same time, and in fact, I actually remember if I'm not mistaken, Grease Monkey or Torque Motorsport getting called out through the intercom. Uh, it was like evening-ish before it got too dark. But I remember actually hearing that. I'm like, is that a video game company sponsoring Formula Drift? Like I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I actually still have the raw files um, of the video that I did, you know, kind of summarizing that weekend. And I went back and yeah, sure as, sure as crap, I could hear you guys talking about the game. Yeah. And now you work for that company, so yeah. how about that? Small world, huh? <laughs> yeah, that was um, it was interviewed by Jared on on the live stream. That was probably one of the most daunting things I've ever done because <laughs> it's not it's not like you're like hidden away in the back. It's like mm -hmm. it's like you see everything. You see the track. You see all of the people, and you're just there, kind of like, oh, I'm live. <laughs> but it was fine. I didn't screw up anything. So that that's that's fun. But, um, I remember um, that the previous night before, or maybe it was qualifying. I actually can't remember. But going to to Koru Works for the for the pre party yeah. meet and running into literally everyone. Um, you know, we talk about Formula Formula D and the racers and the mm. presenters and the the musical artists, and they're all like five feet away from you, and you don't know if you're like shell shocked. You don't know if you should be like what you should be doing, and they're all just normal people. Right. And yeah. I think that was uh, sponsored by, I think it was type S lighting, but that was an incredible, another incredible opportunity to see that these are just normal everyday enthusiasts that just love what they do. I, re I really think that about drifting in, in general, you're able to talk to the drivers and stuff. Yeah. That's amazing. Like you, if you know, F1, you're getting nowhere near the drivers. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it, it is a, it is a great sport for that. I love that it's open. Yeah, that was a that's going to be a topic that I think I'm going to be touching on in a in a video on on my main channel on Alex Martini is does 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 Formula One and Formula Drift are there elements of those two sports that they need to cross over a little bit because I do think Formula Drift needs more awareness and just drifting as a sport racing as a sport in general needs more awareness because it is still seen as a very high entry um, for an everyday enthusiast to jump into. And if people don't feel like they can be a part of it or invest into it, unfortunately, that means that these tracks and these, these events, they can't continue to, to go on. And, and we need to be looking ahead as enthusiasts on how do we keep supporting those tracks and supporting those events, um, to keep the sport growing. Yeah. It becomes a big kind of educational piece too, because a lot of people like what motorsport is judged out there. It's like, 
not many, if anything, but drifting and just like getting that. It's like, you know, it's not a race. You know, these, these cars are going, they're battling against each other, but it's not first to the finish line. You know, they, they change up. So that's, um, yeah. I mean, Tokyo Drift was, is a big help. <laughs> you're like, Do you know what drifting is? And they're like, oh, you know, like, Tokyo Drift, like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, we'll, we'll just go with that for now. But um, there's obviously- I will, I will still always and happily take any mainstream media support towards, a, yep. uh, towards like an automotive or pretty much any sport at any, any time. Um, even if it's not always, you know, accurate, the, the awareness around it, I think really does help. I really do think that. Absolutely. And so yourself around cars and motorsports, I think you said you want to get a license for the, the, the S 2000. Do you have well, any I other kind get, of goals there? I want to get, I want to get certified so that we can do wheel to wheel racing. I have a good friend of mine. His name is Lars Vogler. He has a uh, BMW M2 competition, and he's he's been on I think 30 or so tracks. Um, and I'm always constantly playing catch up to him because he's always at more track events than me. But I want to be able to, or we want to go and essentially chase down, you know, getting our license for that over the next you know year or two, and document that that adventure. Can you can um, you explain show, that show what like. cert, certified? What what do you actually mean? Because you can race all levels in Australia. Um, so for for us at least on on our side, um, when you go into like HPD events and and you're looking to run around a track, you know typically you've got your novice, intermediate, and your advanced. But for the most part, it's all just self practice. You're not you're not wheel to wheel with other people competing for pole position or or racing for you know who's first second or third um to get into that more semi-pro driving and to get into those competitions you know typically requires some form of certification a registration with the sports car club of america making sure that you're actually as 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 advanced as you think you are and then once you have that you get access to to participate in you know competition racing in different areas and different spaces so we want to be able to do that um particularly you know at events that are hosted at road america because it's only an hour away from us um but that requires you know substantial track time testing um peer review things like that so we want to document that adventure and show people you know is it hard is it easy do you need a lot of money do you need no money how do you do it? And then the same thing we want to do in the drifting, you know, adventure. That's the reason that, um, you know, I'm really excited to work with you guys and get a drift car and really get that established to start practicing and seeing just what does it take to jump into the drifting sport? Do you need a lot? Do you not need a lot? What to expect and what maybe not to expect and show the automotive community that no matter what your favorite adventure is, you can go out there and you can do it as long as you have the right mentality. So you you just touched on it. So you, we're going to be building a drift car together. So do you have an idea of what you want to build? Um, yeah. Gosh, I would <laughs> like, there's, there's two parts of me that are fighting, which is like the, the weird one that wants the weird car and like the normal person <laughs> that just needs to say, shut up to the weird one. I think it would probably be really great to jump into something that's, you know, relatable to everyone. Um, whether that be, you know, 350Z or 370Z or jumping into, you know, G35 or something similar, just something that's got a decent platform that we don't mind banging up a little bit uh, because ultimately it's going to, it's going to need to be able to take some abuse. And I think 350s do it really well. 240s do it really well. Um, But here in the States, they are a little pricey. So finding one can be a a little bit rougher than it once was. I actually bought a 240SX when I was like 20 years old for three, no, $4,500 with an SR swap. Nowadays that would go for like 13 grand, 14 grand. So we'll see what we can do, but probably something that's well supported. I don't want to get too crazy with it. Yeah. And what do you guys want to build? Too many. Oh my God. (laughs) Um, I don't know. Like there's, there's so many different cars. Um, I I'm really enjoy drifting my well, my eighty six, which is the 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 BBRZ. It's it's freaking awesome. Um, I have um, it's just so easy to drift. And when you're talking before about not not using the high the hydro, you can easily just drift that with with, with your right foot. It is yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, 
a bit bit of uh, the occasional clutch kick and it, and it absolutely rips. But I think I think a, a 350 or a 370 is a really good idea. They they are um, more bullet bulletproof. Um, though we've managed to break some, but you know, it, I think I think that's a, that's a good idea. Mm. I've got an old. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say unless you have like a plug with Nissan and you can get me <laughs> a, a Nissan Z and then we can do a twin turbo upgrade and get some tunes and go Chris Forsberg with it. I think we should probably stick to something. It isn't, maybe a little bit it isn't, more entry level. it isn't a crazy idea. I think, <laughs> I, I think like planning, but we but like, I, I, that's something I would like to do as well. Um, so <laughs> Forsberg is just like, it's just, look, that car looks amazing. And I would love to, yeah. I'm and apparently, I'm so the, the chassis is, is quite similar to the, 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 the 370. So, you know, parts and, and, and so you, you can actually build on it. So I think, I think that's a possibility. Let's just, let's just get all, all of the partners aligned. You know. Yeah. I would, I would, you know, if I have to sell a soul or a body part, you know, I'm, I'm down, you know, in, in, in all honesty. The Z does share components with the Infinity. I think the Q60 or Q50, I can't remember what it is, but hey, it's out there. Nissan just has to release the car. You know, make it, get it produced. I'd love to see one in like our humble Midwest town of Appleton. You have one on order, don't don't you? Personal? Do. Yeah. Color? So I, you're I, saying is waiting. I'm the only one on this stream that doesn't have one on order. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't this know is, what it is, is about true. Z's, man. I do not understand what it is. It's Porsche, Porsche 911s and the Z, like, any any version of it, I don't know why I enjoy it. Maybe it's just that longer nose, you know, short, short, short butt. I just enjoy the way those cars look. Always have, always will. I think 350Zs are going to age really nicely in the next decade or so. The clean examples, I think, will look good. I think 370s look fantastic. I don't know if Nissan's made a bad-looking Z outside of the the 2 Plus 2 ZX that they made back in the 80s. That was That was hideous. Weren't both of those car like those vehicles in the movie Cars, the Porsche and the three fifty? What are you trying to say, bro? <laughs> I'm just saying, taste has to go, it has to come from somewhere. For Disney, listen, Disney movies. Listen, Billy, it may it may look like I'm like 15 years old, okay, <laughs> but I promise you, my my love for cars did not come from Cars. All right, but it is. Well, I'm glad we got accurate. that out of the way because. <laughs> so the port like. In a in a in a dream world, what Porsche would you would you love to own? I probably know the Gosh. answer to this one anyway. If 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 I could have any Porsche, um, I would love I would love to have a, a nine nine three turbo. Um, that would be my my go to, like a guards red black leather interior. If I could, if I was a car collector, I would love to own a yellow bird. There's only like 60 of them ever made. So they're a wildly expensive car, but I don't know, man, 993s, 964s, G series, all beautiful. I had a red one. It was an 82. It was a whale tail, um, bought it for my wife. And I love that car. It gave me some issues, but I think everyone respects Porsche. Even people that aren't car enthusiasts, they know a Porsche when they see it. There's just you, something about that. You bought it from your wife, did you say? No, I bought it for my wife. It was a surprise. Oh, for your wife. I, just, I was going to say, yeah. that's pretty odd. <laughs> no, buy it from her. Took it, made it more unreal. I'm just kidding. No, I bought it for her. It was an 82 Guards Red, black interior, whale tail. It was awesome. Nice. Don't, don't you have some stories about Porsches in your family, Aaron, that you would you like to disclose oh, on, on the stream? <laughs> <laughs> My 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 mum used to have a, a yellow. It's like an eighty three, I think it was. It had um. It was manual, but there was no clutch. But when you put your hand on um, the gear stick, that's when the clutch was engaged. So it oh. was fr it was fragile as like it was um, and I I like I never got to drive it. My brother was a little bit older, and I remember I got um. I got busted for having a party in the house. So my mom said, um, what Aaron? You, no way. You're, she said, you're, you know, you, you're never allowed to, you know, stay in the house. If, if we're, if we're away. And uh, so she put my brother in charge. Guess what my brother did, my brother and his friend 
took out both both of the cars for the um you know for the for the weekend. <laughs> So it was like, you know, he was like barely 18 and, yeah, ridiculous. Um. <laughs> my, uh, my family never had any, like, fancy cars, so there was never any any terrible stories there. I do remember the first, the second car I ever bought was a 1994 Mitsubishi 3000 GT SL manual, and my dad let me buy it. Um, I sold I, my 1989 Mercedes 300E for it that I bought for three grand. And I remember getting in the car with my dad because obviously he had to, to, to come with me to drop me off. And I asked him if he could just stay in the car with me for a second. He said, sure. I was like, why? Um, because I've never driven a manual before. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I had to learn how to drive manual after buying the car. And it was the most hilariously painful time I think I've ever had in a car. Classic. <laughs> and another thing I actually wanted to ask you, Alex, is we yeah. internally, we get a bit of an insight into yourself because of the internal comms. And I'm just looking at the cat on your desk right now. We kind of <laughs> got to learn that you, you foster cats. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah so, I've, I've, <laughs> so I've always been a big animal guy. I don't know why this is, uh, this is Carmel. He's like our 40th rescue or so. We don't typically get orange cats, but um, yeah, we like we like saving animals, man. I don't know what it is. I just, it's one of those things where and I'm, we're typically very busy. I'm, I'm super busy with, with different things going on. I have you know two small businesses, trying to start up a third, doing content, being a part of the community. Uh, but it's always like, you know, you're translating something, you're giving time to get something back, you're building a car to make a video so people like it. And for some reason, I just have this infatuation that with animals, like you get nothing back from them outside of happiness. So I, I really do <laughs> thoroughly enjoy saving animals. Um, so we rescue cats, cats are typically easier to save than dogs for us just because dogs are wildly loud. Um, but here in Wisconsin, not as many people love cats as much as they love dogs so yeah that's the weird way of saying i have a, a cat problem i think <laughs> love that and i'm curious what else people might not know about you it uh, uh, can be as you know chill as cats or it can be as wild you know we haven't put a, a age rating on this podcast yet so <laughs> <geez>. <laughs> <laughs> so i don't a lot of people may not know that like i'm i'm incredibly organized um, I'm almost insanely organized. So whenever I have something that I need to do, I, I do it, which means a lot of times I'm, I'm not usually finding a lot of time to rest, um, or like just watch TV or play games or stuff like that. Typically I'm running and gunning almost all the time. Um, but things do bug me. Like if my remotes and stuff are out of place on my desk, it, it does bother me. And I need to find wherever that may, may go, which is great because my wife is the exact opposite and will just completely <laughs> blow up a room. And I can go through and grill and cook and make like a fancy dinner. And then it's, and, you know, it's absolutely explode the kitchen. And I'll spend like an hour and a half just organizing, putting everything back, making sure it's in its right place. It's just the thing that I, it's like this tick that I've got. But I love to cook. I love to grill. I'm a huge art guy. I love different types of art. I have a massive respect for, for people who can um, paint. Um, and I love listening to like video essays, as weird as that sounds, like people breaking down movies and things like that. I could listen to them all day while I'm working. Video essays. I'm not sure I've ever heard of that before. Yeah. Like, like any people will break down, people like break down, um, you know, concepts around movies like interstellar or inception mm. or arrival. And they talk about, you know, certain, you know, elements of it. And I enjoy listening to people's, uh, opinions on it just on not really fun that's a weird word maybe not fun. interesting it's enjoyable to listen to <laughs> <laughs> no that'll be your way to check out kind of thing awesome. so, yeah. so you yeah. are being extremely organized yeah you are the opposite of me so and whenever <laughs> i cook there's dishes everywhere so yeah yeah it's it's a problem it's a problem <laughs> <laughs> the problem on both sides, no. Do you yeah. ever get a chance to, I mean, you do, right? You play video games. You um, play anything at the moment? Yeah, so 
I uh, I have a, I've actually this is I'm like I try to be fun and relaxed and approachable. And here I'm going to tell you that I have scheduled time for for gaming on my Google Calendar. But I do to remind me to like sit back and relax. I have a racing sim right next to me um, that I practice on you know, once or twice a week that I try to try to get on and, and enjoy different like base cars. Um, outside of that, I'll play some old school RuneScape. I played RuneScape since I was a child. Oh yeah. Um, I, it's got a stranglehold on me. Like 90% of my analogies in video games have to be around that game. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. I try to, I try to, I try to stream my racing sim and it's a disaster every once in a while because it's just it's a lot of, i need another person to help me with it but i do spend a lot of time by myself just kind of putzing around with a, a 430 on road atlanta and crashing into turn three like every time <laughs> well it's uh it's cheaper to do virtually right and then than in real life so it uh, is not as fun it is nowhere near as fun no not as many no. stories <laughs> <laughs> I, I was able to, I used to have a, a Gen 2 R8. It was a V10. Um, so jealous. We put it We put it back together. It was an awesome car. Loved it. Carbon ceramic brakes, Vorsteiner wing, wheels, Michelin Pilot Sport S tires, H&R lowering springs. And I took that car on Road America, and then I took a, a similar variant in the racing sim to see the differences between the two. Um and it, it was pretty pretty darn close. But the one thing that a racing sim misses that you really don't understand until you're you're in real life is that fear of God of seeing a wall come up at 155 miles an hour, knowing that if you don't break and don't turn, you don't just get to reset the game. I would say that's like the craziest, most simplest difference between the two that you, you really don't realize until you're doing it. Is like that that heart palpitation, that that sweat, that fear. Um, you don't have a racing sim. Mm -hmm. You took your M3 out on the track, right, Aaron? A few years ago. Yeah, I had um. You probably missed that car. I had an an E an E90, and it um, it was it was crazy fast. Um, you put it into M mode, and it um, it was way like way beyond my capabilities. Um, mm -hmm. so it could yeah. As fast as I was willing to go, it was like, yep, that's fine. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, still scared was, the shit out of me. Yeah. That's the yeah, V8? That, yeah, that was the V8. Right? Yep. Sounded amazing. Everyone, everyone on the day was like, your car sounds the best by far. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I, I shouldn't have sold that, man. I shouldn't have sold it. That's anyway. why we're trying to take that S2000 out, the, out there next is because the R8, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a walking TI-87 plus with all the fancy buttons, right? So it can, it can handle anything you throw at it. We want to go with something maybe a little bit more analog um, next year on the track because we really want to put the pressure on on me and the driver to see if if we can still do good stuff out there on that that track without all the fancy fancy tech. Hell yeah! <clears throat> Excuse me. It's probably a good spot to wrap up. We'll leave everybody in suspense. The uh, <laughs> the car builds and things coming up, but. <laughs> We're keen to get you to Formula Drift coming up Absolutely. very soon. It's going to be behind the scenes stuff there, yeah. which we're going to live vicariously th through you. Um, I'll be sure to send you gonna... pictures. <laughs> yeah, pictures, videos, <laughs> autographs. Um, yeah. So, yeah, maybe you could touch on just, you know, what your plans are working with Talk Motorsport in the, in the next sure. few months and what, what people should expect to, to see. Yeah. Yeah, so I think one of the one of the probably the craziest things is you're going to see me at, at different events. You're going to see me at uh, Grantsville, Irwindale for the closer Formula Drift, which is going to be really exciting. I'm going to be running around like a chicken with his head cut off, talking to people, talking to to some of the staff at Formula Drift. You'll be starting to see me getting more involved in in potentially building a vehicle. Hopefully, we can find one that's going to be partnered with Torque Motorsport, which is really really exciting. Um, you'll also actually see me over on the Torque Motorsport YouTube channel. Be doing videos talking about drifting, shorts content, podcasts, um, just a bunch of stuff. So it's it's really going to be a fun opportunity for these two worlds to kind of collide a little bit and, and show a little bit more of maybe uh, the drifting side of world here in, in the United States, but then also just some of the concepts and topics that I think a lot of people are interested in learning more. And I'm able to do that by uh, partnering with Torque Motorsports. So really excited. Yep. Awesome. Super, super exciting stuff. Outside of our channels, where can everyone find you? 
You can find me over at uh, Alex Martini uh, on YouTube and then on Instagram, it's alex.martini with two underscores. You'll see all of my unreliable cars, terrible <laughs> jokes, and occasional funny cat photos there. I would I would apologize, but I'm not sorry for it. So if you follow me, <laughs> that's, that's on you. <laughs> awesome, Alex. Thanks so much for your time and keen to, keen to make some cool stuff with you. And we're going to do this Appreciate again in the future it. too. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Bye.